How many of you have your Bibles with you? That's great. We want to bring our Bibles. Amen. And if you have them, I'm going to ask you to turn back with me to Jude. Next to the last book in the Bible, Jude. No chapters because it's a, a smaller book, only 25 verses. And I think tonight, uh, let's go ahead and, and take a little bit of time and just uh, read through up to our current point um, and get a little bit of context again. So Jude, beginning in the very first verse, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Why do we need to do that? Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain or first estate, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. And yet in the same manner, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand. And the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they've rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and they've perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried along by winds. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. About these also Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds in which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, this is our text tonight. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. As they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. So verses 16 through 18 will be our subject tonight. We've looked at the characteristics of the false teachers and different ways that they've been described. We've seen examples in the Old Testament of them. Tonight, we're going to look at the methods of the false teachers. We're going to see that they have certain methods that they uh, engage in to lead people astray. So with that said, let's ask the Lord to help us as we, as we seek him. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. And I just pray, every one of us here, Lord, we're living in the, the last time, the last days. Lord, we believe we're living in the last of the last of the last days. And what Jude wrote so long ago, almost 2,000 years ago, Lord, it's as true today as it was then. Your word continues to be and will always be just spot on on, ta on target. It's, it's very relevant always. Lord, your word does not and will not uh, end 
continues on forever. And you have given us this little book of Jude as a, a warning, a reminder to us that we that we have to be diligent. We have to contend for the faith. Lord, this is a, is a real battle. Lord, false teachers, certain men have crept in. Lord, they're they're within the churches. It's not just on the outside. Remind us today, encourage us today, um, uplift your people today, give us clear minds and clear hearts to receive your word and to, to never be pulled aside, to never be uh, duped by these false teachers, but instead to just remain true, true to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And we'll give you honor and thanks. We do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we'll see tonight there are methods for these false teachers. So, you know, it's, it's amazing because in just one verse here in verse 16 that we'll start with, you know, Jude is going to kind of tell us the difference. He, he's going to show us the difference between the godly followers of the Lord, like Enoch would be, and these certain men, these others that have come into the church and that he says are already destined for destruction. This should not be new to us. It should not surprise us. And he's going to show us the difference between a godly man like Enoch and these false teachers. So verse 16, again, what are their methods? Well, they're grumblers. They're fault finders. They follow after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly. They flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. All right, so we see all this in this one verse. And, and again, Jude, one thing that I see here is that Jude notices that their methods often revolve around the words that they speak. You notice this in verse 16, that they speak arrogantly in the middle of the verse. But when you have someone that's a grumbler, when you have someone that's a fault finder, when you have someone that is a flatterer, they often use their tongue. They use words, don't they? If you're a grumbler, you know somebody's a grumbler because they what? They complain. You know someone's a fault finder because they tell you, oh boy, that's really messed up. Oh boy, did you see this over here? Oh wow, they can't do anything for nothing. And of course, when you find someone or when you uh, find somebody that flatters, the Old Testament speaks about that. So Jude kind of connects all of these um, methods of the false teachers with how they speak. At least that seems to be a, a, a part of what they do. And, and so on top of their questionable lives, Jude says they're essentially people that are utterly deceptive. You just, they, you cannot believe anything that they say, or at least you should not believe anything that they say, because essentially they are people of deception. They have departed from the foundation of Jesus Christ and, of course, they have departed from the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and they're off saying their own thing, doing their own thing. So that's kind of the big picture of verse 16, and we'll break it down. So we see um, a, a couple of things. We see that they are, again, grumblers. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.10 says it this way. Don't murmur against God and his dealings with you as some of them, meaning the Old Testament saints, especially those in the wilderness, as they did. For that is why God sent his angel to destroy them. God sent a destroying angel to destroy many of these people in the wilderness who were grumbling and complaining. And, and uh, Paul says these are given to us as examples. So when we read through Exodus and uh, numbers and Deuteronomy, and we see some of the judgment of God, as we've already talked about, for instance, with Korah and the rebellion and others. You know, this is because these people were a grumbling people. Complained about everything, didn't they? God delivered them out of Egypt. He delivered them out of slavery. Total and complete domination. They were dying. They, they were not the people of God is in the place where God had them. They're in a different land in slavery. God delivers them from that. Brings incredible miracles. Brings them through the Red Sea. All these things. And if ever there was a, a generation that saw the miracles of God, it was that generation. And I just want to remind you of this. So often 
today. I hear people and, you know, oh, if we only had the miracles, oh, if we only saw the signs and wonders, what a great revival would come. And that sounds good to the ears. And by the way, of course, we believe in miracles. We believe in healings. We've seen God do it. So don't misinterpret me at all. But when our eyes are only focused on those things, we need to remember that that generation that saw more miracles than any other couldn't even make it through to the other side without grumbling and complaining. Oh, why did Moses lead us out here into the wilderness? We surely going to die. Oh, I wish I was back in Egypt. I wish I was back there where I could eat the leeks and the onions and the garlic and all that other... Uh, I would have been wanting to get out of Egypt because I don't like none of that stuff very much. But these people loved it, apparently. And they wanted more. Do you remember? Seriously. Oh, why in the world are we out here? And, and so God gives them manna. I mean, you know, heavenly food. Eventually, that doesn't become good enough, does it? Eventually, oh, man, we need some more meat. And I understand. I, I like meat as much as the next person. Maybe more than some of you, probably. But... But they, they grumbled and complained, and then, you know, God's brought them through. They're in a desert. Oh, well, God's brought us out here. Now we're going to die of thirst. God allows water to come from the rock. I mean, God's not going to let his people die in the wilderness. They see miracle after miracle, but they still complain. And Paul says, remember their example. The author to the Hebrews says the same thing. Don't harden your heart as they did in that day of provocation, that day where these people just said, shook their fists at God and grumbled. Nothing was good enough. Everything was grumbling and complaining. And we live in that type of society today, and it's a real easy thing to fall into, isn't it? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever grumbled or complained, but it's probably been a part of our life at one time or another. So the other day I was speaking with someone and uh, they said, oh, I'm just starving. I'm starving. And I said, you're, you're starving. I mean, they were, you know, serious. Said, well, when did you eat? You know, three hours ago. And they're starving. I mean, where are we at in this society where, where everything, I mean, is, and I'm not talking about this. This person actually was literally was crying, talking to me about this, that they were being starved to death. And I'm like, you're not being starved. Come on. Been three hours, that's all. You're okay. But we, we get into this mode of grumbling about everything. These false teachers were grumblers and complainers. But what were they grumbling and complaining about? Jude doesn't give us all the specifics, but there's no doubt in my mind that these were the type of people that would grumble and complain about what the apostles and prophets said, this is God's standard. This is what God has to say. Ah, I don't like that. I don't believe that. Remember, we already know that these men, that they did not teach the right thing and they did not live the right way. So when the teaching would come up against them, I'm sure they grumbled about that. Oh, but God's a God of grace. God's a God of mercy. We have more light than you do. You guys are stuck in the darkness telling us that, that there's works of the flesh versus fruit of the Spirit. You guys are just stuck in that God is okay with anything that we do in any way that we live. Remember, this is the essence of these false teachers. And so they're grumblers, they're complainers, and they try, and that spirit can rub off. It's real easy if you're around someone that grumbles and complains. It can get to you, can't it? And so that's number one, and obviously this is something that they're, they're voicing, and Paul says be careful with that. But not only are they grumblers, but they're fault finders. And again, similar, they're, they're complaining about something. And, you know, it's been, it's been observed by, by someone that whenever a person gets out of touch with God, they likely to begin to complain all the more. The further we seem to move in our relationship with God away from him, the more we will start finding fault with things. I'm amazed that those that go through persecution in other countries, when, when they ask for prayer from America, you know what they ask? They don't, sit th they don't cry out and say, hey, just pray that God will deliver us, that we'll have no more persecution. That's not what they pray for. You're going to be reminded of that in a couple of weeks when we participate in the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. You're going to see that's not what they're praying for. They're praying for strength. They're praying for the Lord's help so that they can be a witness even when they're in prison, even when they're being persecuted. And oftentimes, to be honest with you, 
Some of them, in their bewilderment, when they hear about how things are done in the West, whether that's America or Europe or wherever, they say, well, what is it with those people that they don't get persecuted? How come those Christians don't get persecuted? What's going on here? Um, well, maybe it's not always their fault that they're being persecuted. Maybe it's our fault that we're not, because maybe we're the ones that are too used to all the good and are not willing to really take a stand for the Lord. Somebody gave a, a, a fascinating illustration between two sports stars, both of who claim to be Christians. And one of them gets slammed in the media for being a Christian. And one of them is actually glorified. Everyone seems to clap. All the worldly people love them. And there's a little survey on those two people. Why does one get slammed and one get applauded? Because the one that gets slammed, actually, when he gets an opportunity, he actually talks about Jesus. And he actually says some things are wrong and some things are right. The other guy just says kind of, you know, the old, oh, peace out, God. Love you, Jesus. You know, never will, in, never will say anything uh, controversial. So, of course, oh, this is a great, oh, we love this guy. This guy over here. He's telling us that a lot, certain lifestyles are wrong. He's telling us certain things are wrong. And so, you know, this is what happens when we get into this place where we're, we're, we're just, you know, what's going on? What's happening? Why, why, you know, and as I said, our brothers and sisters are like, we're being persecuted, but we're not finding fault in that. We're, we're okay, Lord. Help us to be better believers in the midst of this. And we see this as an opportunity to glorify you versus, wow, boy, my boss, uh, you know, he didn't give me the big raise that I wanted. I'm being persecuted. What's going on? Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, this happened and that happened. And, and so there's this, this attitude of fault finding. And it usually happens when we get out of touch with God as we move further away. And, and, and we find this in our own lives. When we're close to the Lord and we're praising him and we're in his word, situations can come up that are not always the most favorable, the things that we like. But you know what? We won't find fault. We'll just say, Lord, this is just an opportunity for you. Just give me strength. Give me, you know, people ask me before service, what do you need? And I'm like, yeah, I need strength. Pray for the Lord just to give me strength and give me encouragement in him. Amen. During all these times that we go through. But we don't want to be fault finders. These men, these false teachers are grumblers and they're always finding fault. Then we're told they follow after their own lusts. And I've told you before that Jude often uh, follows after First and Second Peter. First Peter 2.11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. These men follow their lusts. What are lusts? Strong desires. Remember, lust is not just sexual stuff. It's, it's any strong desire that you have. These men follow after their own lusts, the things that their flesh desires. Peter says, live like aliens and strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from those things. All those temptations that the world throws at, stay away from those things. Amen? Wage, the, wage the, the, the good fight and don't let those things that wage war against your soul take over. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin in order to live um, the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human desires but for God's will. So now that we've come to Christ, we realize that we have a different direction in life. Now it's no longer about me living for myself, but it's about what is God's will. Yeah. These false teachers, it was about them, what they wanted to do. They always, their desire was always, let me be satisfied. Yeah. Whatever's in my heart, whatever's in you know, my desire, let that be satisfied, and I will twist God's word to find a way to make it okay. <laughs> so God says, hey, covenant, one man, one wife, right? One man, one woman, and that's it. That's marriage. That's the covenant. Be satisfied with your partner. But these guys would twist that, and they would say, oh, no, I can have multiple people. I don't have to be faithful in my, in my marriage covenant. That's okay, and God's all right with that. God understands. You know, come on, folks, we're just human. We're just human. God understands all this. This is what the false teachers would say. Living for their own lusts. I love it how uh, Charles Spurgeon said it. 
He said, you know the sort of people alluded to here. Nothing ever satisfies them. They're discontented even with the gospel. The bread of heaven must be cut into three pieces and served on dainty napkins or else they can't eat it. And very soon their soul hates even this light bread. He goes on and he says, there's no way by which a Christian man can serve God so as to please them. They'll pick holes in every preacher's coat. And if the great high priest himself were here, they would find fault with the color of the stones on his breastplate. They'll find, they'll find fault in something. And we've, we, we know people like that, don't we? It shouldn't be in the church. But these, te- these false teachers find fault in everything. And they find fault with God as the apostles and the prophets, as Jesus Christ himself spoke. And then we're told in verse uh, 16 as well that they speak arrogantly. Literally, that means they speak with an overinflated sense of self-importance. And I want to say something to you here because this, again, is a part of their method. If you want to be able to discern the true from the false... Look at how they speak. Did they speak with arrogance? There are a lot of so-called TV preachers that they, there's not a whiff of humility with them at all. It is complete and total pride and arrogance. They, they speak, I see some of them, and they speak with this boastful sarcasm. Just, you know, when, when a preacher, when that's what they major on is sarcasm, that's a big part of their preaching style to be sarcastic about everyone else and everything else, that should be a red flag for you. They speak arrogantly. They speak, um, uh, they belittle. False teachers will always belittle everyone else. And you know why they do that? To get you as the audience to think that, well, they're right. Yeah, I don't, oh, I don't want him laughing at me, so I'm going to agree with him. When he's belittling everyone else, He's, he's sending a signal that says, well, I don't want to be laughed at, so I better agree with him. I've seen these guys. I've seen how they operate. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's false. It's sick. It's, it's this arrogance that comes out of them. But they shape it in such a way and turn it in such a way that they can make it appeal to Christians who think, oh, yeah, that just means they know more than everyone else. If there's not a humility with the preacher, if they're, if they're not leaning on Jesus and they're just telling you constantly everyone else they, they've got it wrong and you need to to follow my little line of teaching here that doesn't measure up with the last 2,000 years of Christianity uh, be careful just the red flag should come up amen? amen and and again chapter and verse and know your Bible from front to back know it and you'll see that humility as opposed to speaking arrogantly, is a key difference between those that speak the truth versus these false teachers. So they speak arrogantly, and then this last little method here in verse 16 is that they flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So they, they flatter people. Um, I like what 2 Peter 2.18 says, and this goes back to speaking arrogantly as well. For by uttering boastful, empty words, these false teachers seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery. They seduce people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. So the people that are just getting into the truth, these false teachers will come come at them and try and pull them and yank them back in to that type of lifestyle. They speak arrogantly and they flatter people. These, these false teachers always know how to use smooth, flattering words to get it to gain an advantage. Oh, I know how to just, I know how to get to this person. You know, I'm always, and you should again, another red flag. If someone comes at you as a Christian, but they, they give off the vibe of a used car salesman. Seriously. No, I'm very, I'm, I'm really serious. You see these guys, again, I'm I'm not trying to get on TV preachers, but honestly, you know, oh, buy our oil, buy this and that, and God will bless you. Just just send in your prayer request. And by the way, some of of these people have been caught throwing the prayer request out in the trash, but of course they're not, they're going to open up the envelope and, oh, here's the money, here's the check, throw the prayer request out. Folks, this happens. I don't want to burst your bubble, but I mean, this is, this is what often happens. But they speak with flattering words. And of course, the Old Testament, you know, in Proverbs has something to say about flattery, doesn't it? You know, better are wounds from a friend than kisses from an enemy, right? 
And so beware of the people that are just looking to flatter you. And unfortunately, sometimes Christians are, are some of the people that are, you know, they come into the church and they've been maybe beaten up. You know, the church is for a lot of times for people that have been wounded. People that know maybe the spirit of God is speaking to them and they know they have issues. And so we come into the church together. We want to glorify God and worship him. And we come in with a certain mindset. These false teachers know it and they'll use flattery to try and pull people in. Oh, yeah, everything's good. Oh, this is wonderful. This is fantastic. And, and you know, they'll say anything. It doesn't matter whether it's good or whether it's bad. They'll say it to get an advantage. And they prey on people. There's the other thing about Christians. When we come together and we come into the church, we don't have our guard up. Like if, I, if I'm going out to buy a car and I'm on the used car lot, which I don't do very often, uh, but if you do, your guard's kind of up when the guy comes, right? And shakes your hand and it's all slimy. And uh, No, I'm just kidding. But, but you know, you, you know how this person is. Oh, wow, you're looking good today. Yeah, what do you do for life? Oh, yeah, I lived there. These guys probably have lived in a hundred different places uh, with every person that comes through the door. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's flattery. Now, if you're at a used car lot, you know. You're, you're anticipating a little bit, right, that, okay, this could happen, so you're aware. When you come into the church, usually we're not anticipating. Oh, no, no, not a false teacher, not somebody that would be deceptive in the church. No, we all love one another. There's no, there's no deception. There's nothing bad. Unfortunately, sometimes, even in the churches, right, we have to be careful. And this is why, with the Lord's help, we want people and we want, hopefully, shepherds that love the Lord and love the people are in, and are in the watch out for these that would come in to just simply flatter to gain an advantage. But, you, you know, again, this is why if you turn on Christian TV or, or on the Internet and you see some guy, you don't know what their lifestyle is. Anybody can put on a good face for a half an hour or an hour. You have no clue what's off to the side of them. That camera is right there. They're in their basement somewhere and prophesying or telling you about the latest, you know, mark of the beast or this or that or whatever it is. And you have no idea what their lifestyle really is. These false teachers, they come in and again, they flatter and they're looking to prey on those that are innocent and those that are quick to believe. And that's, what ha that's why they come into the churches. And so sometimes we have people, and this is not for the false teachers, but sometimes you have people come in to the church and they're just looking for an easy handout, aren't they? And so they come in and may take a couple weeks and they're befriending people. And before you know it, they're at their home all the time and they're eating their food and, and uh, drinking their Dr. Pepper or whatever and doing that. Uh, and they're all these things. And before you know it, they've come in and they've swooped in through flattery. And it's, it's to prey on vulnerable people or people that want to believe the best of others in the church. Because we are called to believe the best of one another, aren't we? We are called to do that, and we are supposed to have some level of trust, but we also have to have discernment. And so these men come in, and again, they try and flatter people. All right, we've got to move on. Verse 17. So we get an about face. But you, beloved, this has been used before. Verse 3, remember, beloved. Verse 1, beloved. Here we have it again. But you, beloved, ought to remember. This is an action word right here. This is a, a verb. This is calling us to an action that Christians need to partake in. You need to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to be different than the false teachers and to be different than those that are just purely gullible. And we need to do something. We need to remember. We need to be in the word and remember the word. Amen. That's one of the things that you and I are called to do. What did Jesus say? What did the apostles say? Well, how am I going to know that, Pastor? Being in the book and staying in the book. Amen? Amen. If you've got a photographic memory, God bless you. Yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Read through, the uh, again, the, the book of Acts one time, and then you can stand up here and take several hours and quote it without, you know, that, that would be awesome. Anybody here, you got that ability? If you do, I, I want to see you. And uh, talk to you after service and, and see what we can do. But, um, you know, he says, remember 
beloved, the words that were spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ and by really by the apostles. And so the word of God is always the answer to the dangers in the church, isn't it? Yeah, right. Notice he didn't say, and I want you to remember about this or that, whatever it might be, but I want you to remember the words that the apostles, those that followed Christ, remember Jesus and then remember their words to you. So Jude is obviously already referencing. He knows Peter. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that Jude is already aware of first and probably second Peter because he's quoting from that quite a bit. And, and, and so he's aware of that. And he's saying, you guys need to remember these things. Hebrews 2 and verse 3. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by those that heard him. So the message has been handed down. And we, it's the apostles and the prophets. And it's in this book. It's not in this book plus another book. It's not this plus the Book of Mormon. It's not this plus any other book that you want to add to it. It is the words of the apostles, the prophets, those that followed the Lord. Here it is for us. You want to know the truth. We need to remember the words. Amen. We must stay in the book. And there's something specific that the apostles have already told them that we come to now in verse 18. These are the, this is the specific of it. These pe they were saying to you, who's the they? It's the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember this. They were saying to you, quote, in the last days, in the last time, there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Jude says the apostles have already warned us. Jesus warned and they have warned. Give you a couple of examples. Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. The apostle Paul says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Warning the elders at Ephesus of what was coming. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in the last days some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Explicitly says this. The Holy Spirit says this. Oh, I thought the Holy Spirit was only just to encourage us. That's kind of a downer. It's not a downer. It's the truth. Remember this. We've heard so much over the decades about positive and negative, haven't we? We've been inundated with it. The power of positive thinking. The power of positive confession. And if we're not careful, we get into this thing of, well, if it feels positive, it's good. But if it somehow feels negative to me, that means it's bad. And so this is kind of a negative. It's not about positive or negative, is it? It's about truth and error. It's about righteousness and unrighteousness. And so... Uh, Paul says, the Spirit explicitly says in the last days, some will depart from the faith because they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A couple of more, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 1. But realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. The time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and they will turn aside to myths. And i got to be honest with you folks. When I look across the Christendom and the landscape today, this is what I see. People are turning aside from the truth of God's word and they're turning to myths. And in another session, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get practical and talk about some of these things. But it's out there everywhere. People are turning aside and away from the truth of God's word. They'll take a text and they'll make it a pretext and they'll just turn it upside down and then they'll run. I've heard people that they start with the text, but by the time they get to the application of the text... They're somewhere else. Today we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk about love, joy, peace. And they'll go through it. And then the application will be something that's the exact opposite. Go out there and fight for your Christianity. Go out there and beat them up. Tear them up. Do the, yeah. It's like, what? Seriously. So they'll, they'll give you the text, but then they'll turn it around. And it's just their attitude, the Spirit, the, everything in the application is the opposite of what they've just preached. I've seen it. I've heard it. 
So we've got to be careful with these things. Remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. In the last days there will be mockers. And I think Jude has in mind those that, and I think this is a part of it, that mock the idea that Jesus will return one day. They mock the idea that our Lord would even come back. That there would, that I, I really believe this is a part of it. Th these guys, whether they're Gnostics or anything else, they're in a totally different space than we as believers. It's not about the person of Jesus Christ. It's about some spiritual light or something else. And so these men are mocking, I believe, at least in part, the return of Jesus Christ. Or he's just talking about those men that would mock the idea that someone would say they're on a path of destruction. We're not on a path of destruction. God's not going to judge us. What are you talking about? And again, it's out there. It's real. And it's, it's taking place. And we need to understand that these men are mockers. Again, 2 Peter 3.3. 3, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their own mocking, following after their own lusts. So know it. Mockers who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. They're, they're going to mock anything or anyone that says we need to be God pleasers. Not man pleasers or self pleasers, but God pleasers. Jude is telling us, reminding us that we, our eyes must be on Jesus and not only our eyes, but our hearts. More and more as I continue on, I'm just praying, God, Lord, help me to care more about what you think than what anyone else thinks. Don't let me be a, a, like these mockers that, that act like, ah, you know, we'll, you know there's, there's no such thing as the judgment seat of Christ. There is. And I understand that that's different than the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment, many books will be opened. That is for unbelievers, as I understand the word. And the, and, and the judgment seat of Christ is for believers. And so we say, oh, nothing, we won't, you know, it'll just be all good. And I guess we'll all come by and we'll be like the seals and God will pat us on the head and throw us a treat. The, the judgment seat of Christ is more than that. It's not about, we're not going to be judged on our past sins that are under the blood, but we will be judged in how we lived out our lives, the time, the talents, the things that God gave to us. Did we use those for his glory and honor or did we just sail along and do our own thing? That's real. That's, that's real. I think these, these men, they mocked all that and were reminded by the apostles and the prophets that in the last days, all of this would increase. And so what this tells me is that Jude wants Christians to actually expect this type of mocking. And again, they're the mockers. They are mocking the teaching of the apostles and the prophets. They're and in that sense, if we hold to that, they're going to mock us. They're going to mock us. They're going to tell us we're wrong. You know what this tells me? If you're wishy-washy, and if you're the kind of person that when you're hanging out with one individual, they can sway you in that direction, but then you go to somebody, they can sway you over here. Christianity is not about that. We need to be persuaded that we know, that we know, that we know what we believe. Christianity is not for people that are, are tossed to and fro. Right? Un, somebody that's, that's that way, they're unstable. James tells us, so unstable in all of our ways when we're just going to the left and to the right. It's like the sea tossing us back and forth. We need to know that we know that we know we need to be in God's word and be reminded that the apostles told us in the last days there will be mockers and they'll follow after their own lusts. Wow. To be forewarned is to be fore, forearmed, right? Isn't that the statement? Isn't that the bit? So, so when I know ahead of time, I can be armed, I can be ready for what's coming. And, and, and I think that's exactly what Jude is telling us. He's saying, be ready to meet the danger of false teachers and heretics of every kind. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, right? That they're ferocious wolves. They're, they're wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing. Beware of them. Be ready for this. It's going to come. It's going to happen. It's difficult when you're young in the Lord and everything is new and you come into this place of, of love and you're just, it's, it's so wonderful. Often don't we wish that we could keep that innocence? 
Remember, remember those first days or weeks or months when you were saved and everything was brand new in your relationship with the Lord and how wonderful it was. And, and there's a, a sense of where we never want to lose that. But do you ever remember the first time that someone that was a claim to be a Christian and they let you down on something or you saw something about them that, whoa, they're saying one thing, but the lifestyle is something else. Probably most of us, if not all of us, have been through some of that. It's tough. And it can be very disillusioning. I can tell you right now, I could have lost the faith, walked away from the call of God, young in my Christian life, just moving into Bible college and, and, and thinking certain men and certain people are, wow, these guys, I'll fight with them because, boy, Jesus must talk to them every night at their bedside. These are the men of God. And, and it's tough when those worlds come crashing down. And folks, this is why I always tell you, listen, don't, don't look to me, look to Jesus. Hopefully, I can set the example and say, follow me as I follow Jesus. But ultimately, you guys better have your eyes on Jesus. You, you can't have your eyes on any, any individual, whether it's me or anyone else. It better be on Jesus. These false teachers are coming in and mocking. And Jude tells us we need to be on our guard. We shouldn't be surprised when we find out that there are people in the churches that either tell or live different lives than what they claim. Being on our guard, listen to me, it doesn't, of course, mean that we need to become critical and, 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 and hyper suspicious. You know, we don't need to be pouncing on everyone. There are some people that live in this, this, they think it's a discernment type of lifestyle, but what they're really doing is if anyone, if there's buzzwords, they hear one word that is different than what they're used to. Oh, oh, that person, you gotta watch out for them. Oh, watch out for them. Well, hold on, give them a chance. Let them explain. Maybe it's not what you think. The Lord, you know, the Lord is not telling us and Jude is not telling us to get hypercritical. I've seen that happen in discernment ministries. We have to be on guard with those type of things. But at the same time, we're not to be naive. We can't assume just because someone has made a profession of faith or because they attend church regularly or even that they're in a position of leadership. We cannot assume that that means automatically this person's above reproach. Give them your whole life. Listen to them no matter what they say because, you know, they're clearly okay. We just want to be careful. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to ask Brother Ivor to, to come. And I, I guess I would just close by saying it's critical that we find the balance in these things. Amen. That we find the balance. How do we do that? We just stay in God's word. Just continue to have the love of the Lord in your heart and love your genuine brothers and sisters that are here. I think we try to be and I think we are a, a loving church and an accepting church. And at the same time, we make no excuse for saying this is God's word. This is, this is the path we're following. Amen. We're not going to deviate to the right or to the left. We love the Lord, but we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're sticking with Jesus because he is coming back. <laughs> I'm going to be on Jesus' side. Amen. And I'm going to stand for the word of God. And I'm not going to stand for any baloney, baloney. My Greek word for baloney. We're not going to stand for that. And so let's find that balance. Let's walk in the love of the Lord. And let's also walk, though, with the awareness that as we get closer to the end, these things are going to pop up more and more. But we're not going to be disillusioned because we don't, we're not going to have our eyes on men. We're going to have our eyes on Jesus. Amen. And Jesus will not fail. He never has and he never will. And we thank the Lord for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I ask that you would just encourage us this evening. As we've looked through these verses and we've seen some of the methods of the false teachers, I pray that our eyes have been opened. That no one here would fall prey to false teachers. But instead, Lord, each and every one of us would be reminded of your word and what you have said and what the apostles have told us through the writing of the New Testament that, that we have now, the old and the new. And Lord, this is the straight and the narrow, the Bible, your book, your word to us. And we're just going to stand on that. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We know that you're with us always. You'll never leave us and never forsake us. We're going to walk with you. And you're going to bring us through on the other side. And we give you thanks and praise for these things. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen.